The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. In Alberta, in Nova Scotia, unprecedented wildfires threaten communities and devour forests. And huge parts of Ontario are under a fire ban as the risks grow here. Tonight, we'll get a read on the blazes across Canada and how to prepare. Then, from foreign interference in Canadian elections to war in Ukraine, we've got the Agenda's Week in Review. It's Friday, June 2nd, and that's ahead on the Agenda. Wildfire season hit early and hard in Alberta, same in Nova Scotia, where unrelenting fires reach all the way into the capital city, Halifax. And here in Ontario, several forest fires burn out of control in the north, for example, near Wawa and Sioux Lookout. With us for a better understanding of what's going on and the costs and causes of these fires, in Fort McMurray, Alberta, Therese Greenwood, journalist and author of What You Take With You, Wildfire, Family and the Road Home. In Halifax, Nova Scotia, Alana Westwood, assistant professor at Dalhousie University School for Resource and Environmental Studies. In Barrie, Ontario, David Phillips, senior climatologist for Environment and Climate Change Canada. And near Zurich, Ontario, Eric Kennedy, associate professor of emergency management at York University. Hi to you all. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this uh, conversation. Uh, it just feels as uh, there's so much tragedy happening in this country right now. Alana, I wanted to start with you. Um, the New York Times called what's happening in Alberta as the Canadian Armageddon. And in Nova Scotia, I saw a story of a family who found out that they needed to be evacuated, but they weren't home. They rushed home to get their pets, a cat and a dog. But unfortunately, they got there too late. Alana, how would you describe the past few days in Nova Scotia? You're in Halifax right now. I am in Halifax. So we have um, the largest wildfire we've ever had in this county is about 25 kilometers away from me. There's smoke blanketing the hills that I can see outside my window. I watched a structure fire uh, burn down a building in these unprecedented hot, dry conditions yesterday. And every person here, I mean, Halifax, half a million people, but feels like a small town knows someone who's lost a home, lost a pet, is now on day six of evacuation. Uh, it's it's one of the most stressful things I can say I and, and our community out here has ever lived through. And as we all know, we've been through a few things in these last few years. Um, I just want to do a quick follow-up. How do you find the response with the communities? Because I'm guessing when you find out, um, I read that some people found out they needed to evacuate within 30 minutes. How do you mobilize as a community to make sure that everybody's safe so fast? Um, incredibly, and I really have to um, uh, put this so much thanks into the hands of our first responders. We've had no uh, no human injuries or deaths, which is incredible. But for example, we were with people on Sunday who got the emergency alerts on their phones and they also went home, were unable to get in, the roads were closed. Fortunately, their pets were rescued and had nothing but the shirts on their backs. But communities have mobilized, donation centers are overflowing. There are many comfort centers open. Most people have found a place with friends or family and are just kind of waiting for the rain so that hopefully those whose, whose homes are standing, about 150 homes have burned so far in the Halifax area, um, can, can go back. And rain is expected for Friday today. We're looking at rain overnight. Uh, please may everyone put in their hopes for us. David, what's causing these wildfires? Well, Nam, I, I think he actually goes back several months. Of course, we had uh, Hurricane Fiona, one of the most destructive uh, hurricanes in Canadian history. It uh, brought down millions of trees, big foliage trees, and, and broke a lot of branches. And so uh, with a lot of dead timber sitting on the ground and drying out for eight months, the region was just a, a province of, of kindling. And uh, and so certainly, forest, you talk to forestry people, and they will often say, well, you know, it's the fuel. You need the fuel. Well, boy, did they ever have the fuel. And then, of course, they also, uh, you need to ignite that fuel. And, uh, and and really, there's been very little lightning activity in uh, in Nova Scotia. But, you know, only 3% of the fires in Nova Scotia 
are, are started by lightning. Most of them are people driven. I mean, people carelessly, some people set them on, on purpose, uh, but whatever, uh, we've certainly, that has been the ignition aspect of it. But then of course, Nam, the, the, the weather has not cooperated. We've had eight of the last nine months have been warmer than normal. Uh, we've had um, the snow disappear early and uh, we had very little snow uh, in parts of uh, the Maritimes this year. Uh, and then it's been so dry. I mean, it's been about, I would say less than 45% of the, of the normal precipitation in March, April, May and Nova Scotia, other parts of uh, New Brunswick. Um, April was the driest April on record. I've talked to, uh, for example, Prince Edward Island farmers who said they've been doing more irrigating of potato crops in the last two weeks than they do in the whole months of July and August. So it's really been the fact the weather hasn't cooperated. The winds, of course, have been very gusty and changing directions. Uh, it, it, it really is uh, almost a case study of, boy, both the, uh, the, the, the wood to burn, the fuel, the, the ignition, and then the, the weather that is just making this the... Uh, the big burn that it is. Um, Eric, David mentioned uh, a number of things that are happening all at the same time. You see these images and you see people uh, describing them as if they're, uh, they're dystopian images. You see desperation from people in many different communities across the country. And being in, being in Toronto just feels uh, as if you can't help those communities. Um, how is the country? How is the country managing all of this? All of these wildfires that are happening across this country. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that I think is so important and effective about the Canadian wildfire system is our ability to share and collaborate and provide mutual aid across this country. And so we've seen that already in droves this season, right? We've seen personnel from Ontario and, and many provinces heading out west to support Alberta in their firefight. And similarly in Nova Scotia right now, we're seeing water bombers from Newfoundland, for instance, contributing and firefighters from Prince Edward Island. That's a huge part of how we manage fire in this country is through collaboration and mutual aid. We always hope that because we have such a large country with some weather and climate variation at any given time, that those jurisdictions that are feeling the brunt of the fires can be assisted by those who might have slightly cooler conditions locally. And, and Therese, I can only imagine what it's like for you to see all of this unfold, uh, especially in Alberta. You've lived through the 2016 Fort McMurray wildfire. Um, can you help us understand uh, what it's like to evacuate for a fire emergency? Well, it, it's absolutely like what your other guests have been describing. It's, it's dystopian. It feels apocalyptic. Uh, one minute in, in our case in Fort McMurray, uh, we had 90,000 people evacuating on the same day. As far as I know, it's still the largest evacuation, and I hope it's always the largest evacuation in Canadian history. But uh, you're, you're suddenly uh, thrust from an ordinary day where the sun is shining and you're putting away your groceries or doing your laundry, that kind of stuff, and then all of a sudden you get a knock on the door and it says you have to be at 15 minutes. Uh, and then the sky immediately turns uh, black with smoke. And everybody, its it feels a little like, I always imagine what the evacuation of Dunkirk must have felt like, because it's every ship a sail, everybody's on the road at the same time. Uh, one of the things that Alana was mentioning about people trying to, to get back into their house after they get the alert, here in Fort McMurray, no one would try to go back to their house anymore. They would evacuate and, and keep going. And that's because we know how fast the wildfire spreads, how uncontrollable it is. I think if you haven't experienced it, you, you think you haven't, you've seen a house maybe on fire, or you've seen the fire department responding. It's absolutely nothing like that in real life. Uh, I wouldn't describe it as a feeling of terror, uh, but that's all, uh, people seem to be, uh, I think we had an advantage in Fort McMurray, to be honest, because we are a big industry town. We are also a safety conscious town and we drill, drill, drill in fire safety. You can be at a black tie event and they will tell you where the fire exits are. It's taken very seriously. So when the evacuation order came down, everyone evacuated. And I think that's the reason we did not see a, a loss of life from the actual fire itself. Um, I'm guessing too, it, it must keep not just you individually, but the community 
kind of in a state of, of hypervigilance. Um, I wanted to read an excerpt from a recent op-ed mm -hmm. that you wrote for the Calgary Herald. Uh, you wrote, these days, it's easy to spot a longtime resident of Fort McMurray. We continually check the Alberta wildfire map, reassuring ourselves there is no wildfire within 100 kilometers. We top up gas tanks, buy bottled water, and slip passports into go bags. Should an evacuation order come, we will not hesitate to obey. Therese, why is that? Well, I think I, I, the priority for people here is human, is human life. And we're well aware of how fast the fire moves and how it quickly overwhelms the fire department, which is not to say that they are not doing their jobs, but this is not the kind of urban fire that firefighters are, are used to fighting. It, it's incredibly hot, incredibly deadly. Um, part of the issue, uh, the big trauma, I think, for a lot of people here in Fort McMurray was we evacuated every building. That means the schools, the hospitals. So people found themselves at work and separated from their children. So the scenario that uh, Alana was describing was, in our case, was people were trying to get to the school to get their children. And we saw a lot of parents that were separated from their children for, for a day, and in some cases, up to three days because some people evacuated north on the only road out of town, some people evacuated south on the only road out of town, and you didn't have any choice. The fire determined that for you. So we saw families that were that were separated. And that is the, there's a lot of trauma involved in it, but that is the part that I think people most relive. Uh, we, and you, I'm sure people are aware there's a big fire going on in, in Fort Chippewan, which is north of Fort McMurray right now. And as soon as, the place where I work, we heard word of that. People started phoning their kids to see where they were in case they had to go pick them up. Um, I saw a video of the chief, and he was in mm -hmm. tears uh, because he also said, you know, he's not just a leader of that community, but he's also a human being. You said something that uh, I think is probably going to stick with me for a while. You said it's you don't have a choice. The fire determines that. David, I saw that you wanted to add something. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I think that uh, one of the things that we have seen in recent years. Uh, is that is the personality of, of wildfires has changed. You know, it used to be the number of fires was important, but now the fires are so much larger. They're also burning longer. I mean, the season used to be a July and August situation, and now it's stretching from April through to, to October. And uh, as Eric pointed out, a great example of cooperation, but we're also getting people coming from overseas, from uh, South Africa, the United States. It's a great cooperation internationally in terms of fighting them. But fighting them is also changed because the fires have got so huge that it's almost impossible to put them out. I mean, you can't put out a roaring fire that's one of the worst in record with a hose. It's like spitting on a campfire and trying to douse it. And so it's really that caused by human beings and nature, yes, but it's almost as if you need nature to put them out, too. It's, it's mm. almost beyond uh, 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 a solution in terms of putting, because they're so huge and they burn so long. I mean, we've seen Port McMurray fire. For example, it was started in May. It was uh, uh, put in out of con in control in July. But a year later, there were still fires burning in the ground. And so my sense is that the character of, of fires have changed. And so therefore, dealing with them. The other thing, too, is there's more people visiting the wilderness. We want that wilderness experience. More of us are living in the in, in, in the forest zone. And so there is more opportunity to set fires uh, in, in these years than it was in, say, 20 or 30 or 50 years ago. Um, Alana, I saw you wanted to say something. I'm going to come to you. But because David brought up uh, the wildfires, I just wanted to bring up some stats just to add more context to our discussion. 40% uh, of wildfires in British Columbia in an average year are human-induced. 85% of wildland fires in North America are caused by human activities. Between 1992 and 2012, man-made fires have tripled in length in North America. Uh, Eric, what is the connection between wildfires, human activities, and climate change? 
Yeah, I think what was just being mentioned is so, so important that this is a multiplicative problem, right? We're dealing not just with one pressure on the system, but a whole bunch of pressures multiplying together to be bigger than the sum of their parts. So the climate driver is, of course, important. When you have drought conditions, when you have hot conditions, when you have windy conditions, these can lead to um, more intense and more severe fires. We can also see that stretching of the fire season so that it's longer starting earlier and going later. But that, as was pointed out, is multiplied by choices in where we build and where we work and where we play and where we put our infrastructure. And it's multiplied by other disasters and other hazards too. So Hurricane Fiona is a great example of this, but so too are the ways that pests have been affecting our forests and, and die off that can happen in particular regions. And it's also multiplied by, by our choices in terms of how we manage fires. So for a long time, we've tried to suppress every fire all the time, and that can lead to a fuel buildup as well. So when a catastrophic fire does occur, it's all the worse. And so this multiplicative effect, where it's not just climate, it's not just natural variation, it's not just where we choose to live, but all of these things multiplied together is part of what leads to the challenges we're seeing today. Alana, uh, Eric mentioned infrastructure. Uh, the Halifax wildfires are the largest urban fire the region has ever seen. What's the impact on the city infrastructure and the surrounding area? Yeah, so it's very interesting, um, both what Eric and said and Teresa have said about the way that we are building in, in what's called kind of the wildland urban interface. So um, there was a report in the Halifax Examiner that there had been warnings from Halifax Fire that three of the subdivisions that are now evacuated and partly burnt um, didn't have adequate evacuation routes, didn't have adequate water water availability or water suppression services. So we really have to think about um, where we're building, you know, if, if there's a lot of pressure on cities, we're undergoing a housing crisis to grow and a lot of folks are looking towards green belts and wildlands. And we really need to think about if we are gonna be putting communities here, we have to protect them. I really appreciate the work um, that you've done, Therese, trying to raise awareness. I think a lot of Canadians in the South, 90% of Canadians are in the South, it was like, oh, Fort, Mar Fort Murray, it's up there, it's in the boreal forest, they get fire all the time, we don't need to think about it. So I'm, I'm hopeful that what's happening in Nova Scotia, while honestly feeling apocalyptic, is a wake-up call that there is no city, there is no community in Canada uh, that can't be thinking about this and preparing for this, both in terms of infrastructure and community planning, uh, but individual preparedness. There's a lot people can do individually to prepare, but there's a lot people can do with their with their yards, with their homes and their gardens to make them as fire safe as possible as well. Therese? Uh, we've definitely seen that in uh, Fort McMurray uh, after the fire. We've adopted extensive fire smart programming. Uh, that means they do things like they cut the parkland back from the from the road, they cut the trees down, They, they're, you have wider verges. There are all these little co efforts to make, the, just to try to slow the fire should it be, be coming forward. But we've also seen a, a very robust look at uh, safety and emergency plans. And so most places have, you know, a fairly aggressive plan of, of how we're going to evacuate again and what's going to happen because we don't know if it, like there's not as much fuel around Fort McMurray right now to burn, but there's there's still fuel. Uh, one of the uh, examples that from Fort Chippewan is there's been a lot of public attention in the fact that they evacuated that community by boat. It sounds like it's a, a last minute decision, but it wasn't, it was in their emergency plan. So they have a very uh, sound emergency plan that they worked on with the larger municipalities, the RCMP, the province, and, and it called for uh, evacuation by air and boat. And they immediately started executing their plan. And that's, I think, how they were able to evacuate their community uh, relatively quickly, given their remote area, they're only ac accessible by uh, by boat and air in the summer. Um, Eric, uh, Therese, just to follow up on what Therese was saying, when you have these uh, planned emergency responses already laid out so people know how to respond, do you think that uh, Ontario should be doing more, or how are we doing here in this province? 
So I think the agencies across the country are realizing the threat and, and working hard to try to mitigate it. But there are some ways that we need to update some of our understandings and think a little differently about fire. Um, one shift that's happening is, is that we're seeing not just an acknowledgement of the wilderness urban interface or WUI as it's often referred to, but the way that this is really an intermix Right? It's not a clean line between where we have the forests and where we have the people, but rather an intermix where they're really enmeshed in each other. Um, and that means different strategies when it comes to firefighting and when it comes to preparedness. We also have to recognize that the kinds of evacuation plans we might write in a theoretical context might not make sense on the ground. So we've heard this great example about, well, what do you do if your evacuation plan was based on leaving from home, but you find yourself at work or shopping or you find your family separated at the time. And so we're going to need to keep seeing more and more agility in thinking about how we prepare people for evacuation in complex contexts and dealing with these cascading effects. Uh, David, I was reading something that said that um, for some people who have been evacuated to, I guess, to qualify for federal programs, you have to be, I guess, displaced for maybe seven days. And one family was saying they had been displaced for six days. And now we're hearing that uh, bans are being introduced in, say, Nova Scotia. I think the ban was somewhere around $200, $235, Alana, and now it's $25,000, like in the thousands of dollars. Um, what do you, do you think that these uh, bans actually work to help people understand uh, the repercussion of their actions, or do you think more needs to be done um, in that case? Well, I, I certainly think bans work, and I think governments have to be more strict in issuing bans. Uh, hey, just because you can't roast your weenies on a particular weekend in uh, Algonquin Park, for example, well, so what? I mean, if it's going to uh, uh, keep the fire risk uh, lower and that you could then enjoy it maybe next month or the month after, then I think that we need to uh, uh, to, to to have those measures in hand and, and make them very, very strict. Because you see, so many of the fires at this time of the year are caused not by lightning. I mean, that's that comes later. It's caused by people. And so I think that um, just denying people the opportunity to have a campfire, um, I think is is good. I mean, they can visit the wilderness, but they, hey, they, they have to take measures that they maybe not like, but it's for the best of, um, uh, uh, of everything. I think also that we have to, um, you know, in terms of, uh, was mentioned by the other guests uh, about introducing different codes. So if you if you build your your dream home in the wilderness or uh, by yourself, then hey, you don't use just city standards. You put make sure that you have fire retardant shingles on that. You in a community that we don't allow communities to develop without uh, uh, buffer zones between the forest and the and the actual uh, the town site itself. So I think we have to be sort of a bit harsh. I think the uh, uh, pricey kind of bans and fines are, are are a good idea. I think we have to get into people's minds that this is a serious issue. This is not something that's just a, a rural or countryside kind of, it's everybody. Because you see, the problem is everybody smells the smoke. Huh. And that is very toxic. It is, we don't know what the long-term effects of breathing smoke it is in Calgary, for example. I mean, you can see the mountains most days uh, from your home. During the fires recently, you could not see across the street. I mean, they had like normally nine hours a year with haze and smoke. They had over 500 hours of haze and smoke. So it's a different environment under these kind of uh, situations. And I think that people need to be shaken up to the fact that, hey, uh, this needs action now. We don't have to wait for it in, in 20 years. This is something going on right now. Alana? Yeah, and I mean, certainly um, uh, foresters, environmental scientists like myself and many of us have been, have been warning this was coming. There is no shortage of warning. So what I would really urge viewers to consider is, is your community responding to the severity of these increases in natural disasters? And if, you know, we don't take um, proactive measures to curb human-caused climate change right now, they will continue to worsen. So I would really encourage 
um, viewers to 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 grab the email of their of their MLA of their MPP and ask kind of what what is the emergency plan in our community? Where can I find it? Do you have one? Are we adequately resourced? What are we doing um, to mitigate? What are the threats? And make sure that uh, make sure that elected officials are taking this as seriously as they should be. Um, Therese. I think everything Atlanta said is absolutely correct, and it's certainly something that we've seen in in Fort McMurray post fire. But and I also want to say that we, you know, please take your own individual responsibility to prepare your go bag. Uh, make sure you know how to get out of town in, in an emergency. And I mean, all the way out out of town. I, I've worked for a couple of municipalities. And uh, as I'm sure David knows, we, you always have three backup emergency operation centers. Well, in Fort McMurray, we, all three were on fire. So, you know, we were running, thing, things were being run out of Edmonton. And so, but, but the other piece that I just like people to know is in a fire of this magnitude, no one can come to help you. They're, they're busy protecting the infrastructure that's going to help you escape. Uh, so they're 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 protecting the water treatment plant. They're protecting the main highways. Uh, they're protecting you know key access egress and access routes in and out of town, and and so you really have to understand that you're going to have to make your own decisions. Mm. It, are you? I hope I hope you don't. I hope you're not in that situation. But certainly here. Uh, the fire was so rapid and overwhelming, like Raging Inferno is, doesn't even describe what it was like. Uh, you're going to have to, uh, you can't sit and wait. You just have to, you have to uh, take charge of yourself and, and make sure that you're able to, to uh, escape, which I should also say in Fort McMurray was much easier because we have an incredibly young population here. The average age is about uh, 32. So we weren't evacuating as many people from, we did evacuate the seniors home, but they weren't in the kind of numbers that you're gonna see in some Ontario towns for sure. Uh, we only have a few minutes, but I wanted to follow up on something that you said, Therese, for people to be um, uh, prepared on an individual basis. When it comes to rebuilding uh, uh, someone's home, insurance plays a huge role. Do you think we need to rethink insurance policy in a time of increased natural disasters? Uh, I, can, I can tell you from a personal point of view, uh, you need every individual needs to read their own insurance policy and see what they're covered for. I, uh, I actually had an excellent insurance policy uh, with a reputable insurance company, and it was still over two years before we could get our house rebuilt, and the insurance company was actually very helpful. But if you're in the north, very short building season. Uh, and the other thing I think that people need to realize is you're not just rebuilding your house. Uh, 3,000 homes are being rebuilt. So there's a, it, we saw during the pandemic the competition for goods and supplies, supply chain things. Those issues are so amplified in this kind of mass building process that it can get very expensive very, very quickly. Um, Eric, you know, the Premier of Nova Scotia, Tim, Tim Houston, has requested more support from the federal government. Um, when all of these wildfires are happening in so many different co communities across the country, what would you say are some of the solutions at uh, facing this? Yeah, it's a huge and complex problem, and it really needs a, a whole of society kind of approach to dealing with it. I'm not going to disagree that the individual pieces are important. You absolutely have a responsibility to prevent uh, forest fires from happening and to not be that spark that ignites them, and to be mindful of the different ways that you might accidentally cause a fire. So paying attention to how you're using ATVs and vehicles, for instance. It's not just about your campfire being fully extinguished. There are lots of other hazards we have to pay attention to. But I think this question highlights the really systematic nature of this problem, right? We need those systemic solutions that tackle the building code issues, that make sure we have the capacity for firefighting um, at a provincial level in every province, not just so that we have the resources there for when times are tough, but also so that we can continue to work effectively in the sharing mode, that there are enough aggregated resources across all the provinces to be able to send to the jurisdictions that are particularly in need. 
And we have to redefine our paradigm here. This is not just about occasional fires in faraway places. This is about big fires that affect communities that show up in unexpected locations near to urban centers, near to the places that we live and, and play and work. And so we need a paradigm that stops seeing these as one-off events that take place happening and affecting someone else and recognizing that we have to learn to live with fire on a national basis, that we need to invest much more into preparedness, into healthy ecosystems, into getting ready, and into designing our communities in a way that they can potentially live with these fire impacts without being absolutely tragic and devastating. We only have about two minutes left, but I wanted to get Therese, David, and Alana um, to respond as well. You all have 30 seconds. Alana? I mostly just appreciate folks hosting panels like these so that, like Eric said, we can really um, help everyone to know that this, this is a whole of Canada problem and something that we really need to think about putting more resources into. And I also appreciate what you said, Eric, about healthy ecosystems. So um, I work in forestry and natural resource management and how we do forestry is actually a piece of this we haven't talked about but need to be paying attention to because we can do forestry in a way that makes fires uh, makes forests more resilient to fire on the long term or in ways that can make them more susceptible to these kind of bigger fires. These conversations are happening in Nova Scotia, but they really need to be happening in every province in Canada. And Therese? Uh, I, I agree with everything Alana said. It, the fire is ch fire is changing. It's not uh, like it used to. It's We can't think of it the way that we've always thought of it. Uh, also, I, I want everyone to think about their own safety because when you have a close call like we've had up here and you realize how some split second decisions can, can put your life at risk, I, I would really want to urge people to make sure, like, th put, pe put people's lives instead of property when you're making your decisions on the day when you get that 15 minute evacuation notice. And David. Well, uh, I think what we have to understand that this is not just a one off, this is not bad luck. This is not a, a fluctuation. This is a trend. Uh, I think that what we've seen is what we're going to, what we've experienced, what we're going to see even more uh, in the in the in the uh, days to to come. Particularly this year, we forest fire season has just started in Ontario. We have some areas that are in extreme situation. We're coming to the vacation season. We're also coming to the to the lightning season. So I say, stay stay put. You haven't seen anything yet. Um, our appreciation to all of you making the time to speak to us. Uh, our thoughts with you, Therese and Alana, and all the communities across the country that are being impacted by this. We really appreciate your insights. Thank you. The agenda this week, assess the state of the war in Ukraine, debated bike lanes in the provincial capital, and asked if what are considered the usual life milestones need to be updated. The agenda's week in review begins considering the problem of interference by foreign states in Canadian elections. I was surprised by the fact that Mr. Johnson didn't hold a public inquiry, as Laura was referring to there. but. I was also really surprised, and maybe it's uh, my naive uh, optimism, I was surprised when the opposition leaders, the two opposition leaders, turned down the chance to read what was in the, the documents and calling it a trap. And, uh, you know, as I said before, how low this went. I'm trying to imagine another G7 country where a legislator turns down a chance to read a top secret national security report on a matter that has been before Parliament for the last few months. I, I I think that tells us where this debate is and where our politics are, but uh, I still was quite surprised. Um, the, the idea that they would be silenced by this, you know, uh, people have had some fun with it too, is, is are these opposition leaders never going to go into a cabinet meeting because they can't talk about it after? Or they never have a, a caucus meeting? This is, uh, pol all politics is not done in the open. Um, and I I do confess to some surprise at that. Well, Richard Fadden, let's take them at their word when they said, how are we supposed to ask difficult, tough questions of the government if we have been sworn in and kind of taken into the government's confidence? We're sort of hamstrung to do that job if that happens. What do you think of that argument? 
I think it's overstating the, the constraints under which they're operating. Yes, they cannot refer to particular intelligence that they may have seen, but it will give them an indication as to whether or not broader questioning is going up the right path or not. Um, you know, I had access to a lot of highly classified information throughout my career, and I appeared before Parliament and uh, on a number of occasions. And what I tried to do was to aggregate up what I knew and still try and answer their questions. So I, I think they're overstating the constraints they operate under. I wonder if I could make another general point. I think this is illustrative of another much more serious problem Parliament has. Uh, Parliamentarians in Canada fundamentally have no access to classified information. You take MPs, they become ministers, and they're instant instantaneously expected to be experts in national security and highly secure material. Our British and Australian friends have found a way to give not total access, but much, much more access to Parliament. Uh, Mr. Trudeau's offer, I think, was genuine at one level, but probably was motivated to some extent by political expediency. But I think as part of this broad exercise, we should also give some thought to finding ways to give parliamentarians regular, ongoing access to classified information. Not as much as the U.S. Congress, because they have a different system, but perhaps as much as the Britain and the Australians have. Laura, I gather they don't do that because they don't think that opposition backbenchers can keep a secret or that they're worried that loose lips will sink ships. Is that a reasonable concern? <laughs> Well, I, I don't know all the uh, nuances behind these decisions, but I, I think uh, the fact that we've had these leaks right now would suggest that some of the concerns might be somewhat founded. I mean, I'm with Susan. I was surprised that they didn't, uh, you know, take up the offer to be able to look at these documents. And it just speaks to this culture of not working together, I guess, like uh, just so highly partisan that it's, you know, this is a, a really big concern that we should be dealing with at the parliamentary level um, as a nation. And instead, what we're seeing is concerns about who gets to say what, when. And I'm a little worried that we're going to be losing sight of the bigger picture because we're worried about leaks or worried about who's saying this or who's saying that rather than trying to actually, you know, work to protect the integrity of our democracy. Well, I'm going to take your advice and move on to the bigger picture here. And I guess, it, you know, the bigger picture here is not just this government, but Canadian governments in general. Are they as attentive to matters of national security and protecting our democracy from foreign interference as they should be? Akash, you've been watching the national scene for a couple of decades. How does it look to you? They are absolutely not um, sufficiently attentive to these issues. One of the conclusions of, of Johnson's initial report was that information was being provided to the PMO and to Cabinet, but it wasn't being being read because it was being provided in a format or in a way that political staffers and ministers themselves found to be difficult, impenetra impenetrable or onerous. I don't think that that exonerates them in any way, shape or form, because ultimately this is their system. If the system was such that they did not feel they were able to get a grasp on what they were being told by the security security services, it was their responsibilities to fix that and to fix it before it became a matter of controversy. Yes, there are black binders that are full of under differentiated information. You have to do your homework if you're in high school. You should have to do your homework if you're in, if you're in cabinet. And if the nature of that information being relayed to you is again impenetrable, you have the power that is necessary to ask for that information in, a, in an alternative form. I think we also have to bear in mind that foreign interference in democratic elections is not the exception, it is the rule. Of about 200 countries in the international system, perhaps as few as 25 of them are full democracies. That means that the vast majority of, of countries in the international system are non-democratic and are hostile to democracies. It is in their interest, not just in China, but in every other totalitarian state, to make the case that democracies cannot succeed, democracies will always fail, and to project their power into democracies in an attempt to do that. We have to be, bear in mind, as one of the few democracies in the world, that we will always be beset by an ocean of enemies of democracy, and we have to take that seriously. I see no evidence that, that is being taken seriously. Well, having said that, and Richard Fadden, I'll go to you on this, no known interference from China, says the report. You buying that? No, absolutely not. I think that's dead wrong. Can I back up a little bit and, and make try and explain why I think this government and previous governments don't spend enough time on national security? Sure. 
We don't feel particularly threatened in Canada. We have three oceans and we have the United States. So as a country, we don't worry a lot about national security and we don't think a lot about it. During the course of the last two federal elections, the issue foreign defense and security policy did not come up once. I think that's wrong because there are real threats against Canada, both the terrorist side, foreign interference, foreign espionage is now worse than it was during the height of the Cold War. We don't have a national security culture like all of our allies do. And I don't quite know what to do about it except to expect our national leaders to talk about this more in a, in a reasonable manner. But until uh, they see votes in national security, with the exception of real crises, I think when there are real crises, we do respond fairly well as a country. But until there are votes in national security, politicians are going to pay more attention to economic or social policy. The reason this counteroffensive matters so much, I don't think we should look at it only in terms of the amount of territory that Ukraine can take back. How well should we look at it? How, how many Russian troops are left standing at the end of this? Because then Vladimir Putin will be confronted with a very tough decision to see order a second wave of mobilization. And I, there are interesting polls in Russia about Russian support. You know, all of us would admit it's really hard to do good public opinion sampling. But the more independent pollsters in Moscow, what they're showing is what we would call thin support. They're not showing opposition, but the support is thin. And another large mobilization of the kind that Putin was forced to do last September is not something I suspect that he wants to do. Andrew, let's pick up the story with the spring offensive, so-called, that Ukraine is uh, apparently planning. Uh, again, no one knows for sure, but um, if, if you were a general looking at the battlefield, how would you see that playing out over the next several weeks and or months? Well, from the Ukrainian point of view, their weakest spot is, is people power. Uh, the West can supply them weapons, and uh, they are supplying uh, all the weapons the Ukraine more or less needs. However, they are not going to supply people because NATO is not going to go to war with Russia. So the Ukrainians have a diminishing pool of people that they can put into the fight. And this upcoming offensive, this is a deliberate offensive being planned by Ukraine against a deliberate Russian defense. And we have not seen this in the war as yet where both sides are fully prepared, fully determined, and casualties should be expected to be quite high. The Russians are fortified. So if, if you're a Ukrainian general, you're looking at this, how do I attack minimizing my casualties at the same time knowing that I will not achieve the strategic objective of Ukraine, which is to push the Russians back to the 1991 borders, including Crimea. Now. That puts the Ukraine into an everlasting war, almost a war, a renewed offensive in the fall, perhaps, after suffering significant casualties and pressure from the West and others that maybe it's time to look at a ceasefire, which the Ukrainians desperately do not want to look at a ceasefire. So alternatively, Ukrainians might be looking at new ways of attacking, not a large scale offensive, but small probing offensives that bite away at the Russian lines without the Ukrainians sustaining heavy casualties. The drone attacks, these attacks in, in, in Belgorod and so on, are part of wearing down the Russians. So that's that could be a new innovative way that the Ukrainians are doing, because in a classic way, they're going to hit the Russian line, try to punch through, threaten Crimea in your Kershaw and sustain heavy casualties and be forced to examine a prospect of a ceasefire or keep fighting in 2024. Hmm. Jeff, can you pick up on that? How do you see a potential spring offensive playing out? Yeah, I would, I would agree with Andrew completely on this. And for all the losses of manpower that Russia has has had, Ukraine suffers more uh, when it's one-to-one -one or even two-to-one situations. And of course, when you, once you have an offensive, uh, the offensive forces uh, confronting a forces dug in are generally expected to lose more in terms of human casualties. So I think this is why we have seen uh, continued delay in the offensive, uh, this managing of expectations that Janice mentioned, uh, this effort to have these missile strikes around Belgorod, potentially uh, in Moscow. And just as Moscow is itself hitting Kiev with a 
with missiles trying to wear down the Ukrainian defenses and trying to wear down uh, Ukrainian anti-aircraft, trying to force them to defend a broader scope of territory as well. So we're going to see moves and counter moves in the next few months, more like Andrew described, rather than one of these massive def um, offensives that we saw in the fall, where Ukraine was able to punch through the Russian lines because the fortifications are just too tight right now, and Ukraine has to watch every man so carefully. Yeah, Erica, maybe you could pick up on that in as much as if, if there's an understanding in Ukraine that a sort of typical massive spring offensive isn't going to achieve the strategic objectives that one would expect, I don't mean this question to sound naive, but is there any point in doing it then? Well, I mean, I think if I was a Ukrainian general, I would be very concerned about the winter, the coming winter, because Russian tanks are more maneuverable in the winter. And so I'd be wanting this counteroffensive to succeed. But at the same time, I think it's very true to say that this is really an international campaign where Zelensky has to travel internationally and try to get support. And so they need to sound as if they are going to have a success. And frankly, whatever happens can be interpreted as a success by the West. And that's the problem, is we will never actually really know. Just like in Afghanistan, where we were constantly told that, oh, the, the Afghan National Security Forces have captured 51% of the country, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the end, we found out, no, no, no. So what I'm saying is, it is it's kind of the media. It's kind of a, a, a situation where we in the West want them to win, but we won't really ever know. And this war could drag on for years and years. The only thing I think that could happen would be that Putin dies. He's in a cocoon. He's not seeing anyone. They have to wait for a week to see him. Maybe if he dies or he retires early somehow, then that might change how we get to the table. But we've got to get to the table. And so I don't think the number of deaths is important. It's whether what Putin does. I'd like to hear what Janice thinks about that. Okay. We're going to find that out right now. Um, I, look, look, I'm, I'm agreeing with everybody here that this this offensive, however it unfolds, and I tend to think it will be, and they're telegraphing this, um, the Ukrainians are, it'll be a series of smaller ones rather than roll the dice on one big one. Mm -hmm. You know, when the, when the Ukrainians broke through last year, and it's very important that people understand that in the West, the Russians had not had time to do what they've done now, which is to prepare, dig in, and fortify. So it's going to be much, much more expensive in lives and casualties. So I think the, the Ukrainians are, are well aware of that. Where I'm less optimistic a little bit than, than Erica is about the timing of getting to the table. Paul, get us started here. The traditional deadline for life's milestones typically tend to be between the ages of 20 and 30. Can you give us some sense about how these expectations originated to begin with? Well, I think that these dead, these timelines originated based on the sort of social practices of the day. You know, when people were coupling up, when people were completing school, when people landed a job, when did they get their secure housing, and uh, those established norms over time. And I think this conversation is bubbling up right now because the norms of the past few decades, especially when baby boomers started out, they are not today's norms. And they're not today's norms because hard work isn't paying off for a younger demographic as it's, it's starting into its adult years. And as a result, it's causing a range of delays in milestones that some decades ago we thought had become the norm. Well, let me follow up with Tony on that. Do you think the young people, for example, that you engage with at your university, do you think they judge themselves and their circumstances by their parents' milestone expectations? Well, Steve, I think that the milestone expectations go beyond their parents. They're getting reinforced in society, uh, even through their friends and extended uh, networks. So the pressure that students are feeling is real. They're very focused on, I need to get a good job. I need to be financially stable. They're thinking about the potential of coupling up, the potential of having kids and not having kids. So they're really grappling with, you know, what do I do next? And what does it mean to be an adult? And what does it mean to be me? They are thinking about all this at ages 18, 19, 20? Oh, absolutely. Really? Absolutely. Is that healthy? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I would say it's healthy or not healthy, but these are the concerns of emerging adulthood, though, and that's the, the stage of life that they're in. Dave, let me get you in here because we've invited you here because you wrote a piece in the Globe and Mail mm -hmm. 
about the end of your marriage, which I got to say was was extremely uh, a beautiful piece and quite heartbreaking all at the same time. Mm. And you said in that piece, the entire future I had taken for granted was suddenly gone. I wonder how all of that contributed to a sense of derailment in your life that the, again, the milestones that you had expected to live by were suddenly all askew. Oh, sure. Everything's just a blank page now, right? I mean, I think your big milestones from 20 to 30, like you said, are, you know, graduate school, find a good paying job, get married, have kids, find a house, right? Let's say those are the big ones. But from 40 on, you know, I was living in the house that I thought I was going to die in. I expected retirement and, and a plan, yeah. not even a plan, an assumed life had just suddenly vanished in the aftermath of my divorce, right? Now you have to, where am I going to live? How are we going to share the kids? What is my retirement going to look like? What is, what is my entire life going to look like? And, and that uncertainty, it's, it's a scary thing to face. Was yeah. there any satisfaction in knowing that once you went public with your circumstances, you had a whole bunch of friends who said, oh, guess what? I feel your pain, brother. I've been oh, there, too. Everyone. So many phone calls, <laughs> so many emails. And it goes back to the point of the story, which is how much men are, are reluctant often to talk about what's going on in their own lives. But certainly, it's, it's comforting to have friends come out of the woodwork and say, hey, me too. Uh, there was even a period where, you know, I'm looking for housing in Toronto because I want to be here still in the city and maintain a certain continuity for my kids' lives. And me and another divorced dad were only half jokingly talking about living in an 80s sitcom where we would buy a house together <laughs> and he'd have his kids the week that I didn't and you know vice versa because that's just how sort of difficult that transition could be in this brave new world where none of the milestones you think are easy are, as, are easy anymore. How close did that come to actually happening? Um, too close for comfort. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Paul, why don't you come in here and tell us, uh, again, you deal with uh, young people, obviously, in, in uh, the course of your day with your university responsibilities and with your Think and Change tank. How much are today's young people, do you think, still influenced by the sort of old-fashioned strictures um, that were just outlined by our guests here? Well, it's, you know, it remains a part of the cultural context by which people judge whether or not they're being successful. I mean, one thing that Jen Squeeze had to do in our early days was help a younger demographic as they're starting into their adult years recognize that if they're struggling to establish a financial foundation, that's not because they're necessarily doing something individually wrong. It's because the way in which the economy and society has evolved has made their hard work pay off less and we haven't used public policy to adapt all that urgently for them. You say you're not against bike lanes, but you may have a different view on how well we're doing. What's your take? Well, listen, uh, we set up Keep Toronto Moving, Steve, uh, not because we're against bike lanes at all, but we just feel that they're not being put in the right places. The reality is, if you look to the 2011, to 2016, and the 2021 census, we have about 1.5% to 2% of identified commuters through the census uh, advising us that they use bike lanes to get to work and back. And so why we're putting bike lanes on some of the busiest streets in the city, like Young Street, like the Danforth, like Bloor Street, makes to me no sense. It's not good for cyclists, because why would you want to put cyclists on the busiest streets when there are alternative streets that cyclists could use much more safely? Ellison, you want to speak to that? I sure do. Uh, so like people who drive their cars, the reason that um, there needs to be more bike lanes on busy streets is because those are where all the locations and destinations are. So what we found, for example, during COVID, one of the reasons why the city implemented active TO, it was to provide alternative, safe transportation options for essential workers, uh, many healthcare professionals. So for example, one of the reasons that the university bike lanes were implemented was at the request of doctors and health professionals that needed that safe way to get to it. And so whereas the success of our car infrastructure, it hinges on the fact that it's interconnected and across the city. And so just as we did when we built our system of automobility and built our roads and streets, we now need to add additional lanes for bikes 
to make it safer for people walking, taking transit, and biking. Let me put that to Eleanor McMahon. Uh, Eleanor, you heard uh, Trevor say that only 1.5 to 2 percent of people who are commuting are using bike lanes, and that's there's a lot of infrastructure going in to accommodate a relatively small slice of the commuting public. What's your view on that? Two things, Steve. It's chicken and egg. If you build it, they will come. So basing our urban planning around current uh, current measures is is not visionary, and it's not good city building and city planning. It's also not accommodating what people want. I have another survey to put in the window, and it's one that we did at the Share the Road Cycling Coalition, aligned with our Ontario Bike Summit earlier this year, in fact, just in April. And we did a study and we looked at, we did a poll of Ontarians and a couple of important things emerged. First of all, over the last 10 years, the number of people riding daily has gone up fivefold. So now 22% uh, of Ontarians are daily cyclists. That's close to 4 million people who are riding their bike every day, uh, over 3 million people. And that's extraordinary. And those people want and need safe spaces to ride, I think, as a society. We have an obligation to find ways for them to ride, to go to places that they want. And it's in our absolute interest to do that because the bicycle that's beside you or in front of you in some cases, ideally beside you in a protected infrastructure and bike lane is the car that isn't. And more people getting out of their cars more often enhances affordability, enhances people's well-being, enhances economic activity actually. And if we can find safe and smart ways to do it, as cities around the world are doing. I just got back from the Global Cycling Conference, Velo City in Germany. So I guess I'm inspired by cities all around the world that are doing exactly what Canada is trying to do. And we are making some progress, but more needs to be done. And I would say that since 40% of our trips in Canada are under 10 kilometers, and indeed 30% of them are under two kilometers, most of our daily trips are doable by bicycle. And we can start to think of converting those trips and, and making infrastructure a primary uh, way to invest and so that we can engineer that. That's just some of what we covered this week. You can find more, including the full conversations, on our website, tvo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash the agenda. And that's all for this Friday, June 2nd, 2023. Monday, Steve talks to Toronto Star Books editor Deborah Dundas about her new book that explores class and why it matters to hear the stories of those living in poverty in their own voices. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at TVO.org. Have a great weekend, and Steve will see you on Monday. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.